To all God's people said, Amen. let us rise and worship the triune God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And also to you. Hebrews 2, 10 through 12. For it became him for whom, all, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, as your saints, our whole week revolves around this service of worship. We are invited up into the heavenly place to join with all the saints, past, present, and future, to render unto you the glory you so greatly deserve. We praise you that by your Son we can come boldly into your throne room. So this morning, fill our mouths with your praise, our hearts with your word, that we might go forth into the rest of this week encouraged to do the work you've called us to do. So Almighty God, we worship you now through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. And amen. amen. Let's join our voices together to sing from heaven, O praise the Lord, found on page 192. Patience, or what the King James translation translates as long-suffering, is amongst the virtues listed in the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, the word in Greek for those who keep that sort of score is macrothumia. The fruit of the Spirit is set in contrast with the fruit or works of the flesh. In the middle of that tawdry list is a word commonly translated as wrath or thumos. Again, for the Greek scholars here. So the work of the flesh, wrath or thumos, is set at odds with the fruit of the spirit, patience, long-suffering, or macrothumia. A simple way of showing what's being highlighted and contrasted here by this comparison is to borrow from the world of chemistry. The flesh, in other words, has a, an incredibly low boiling point. That's wrath. The flesh boils at room temperature. Whereas the spirit produces within the believer a much higher heat threshold before boiling over. That's long suffering or long until wrathful. The Holy Spirit turns the saint into tungsten steel, which doesn't boil until it reaches 10,706 degrees Fahrenheit, or so Wikipedia tells me. So let me ask you, what is your boiling point? When your child or your spouse or your coworker does something that annoys, bothers, pesters you, that raises the temperature in your life, how do you respond? The flesh explodes at the slightest bump and sends shrapnel into everyone in proximity. You may think that their peskiness justly warrants such an incendiary response from you, but that's because you are full of the wrath of man, not the long suffering of the spirit. The spirit expands your capacity to endure slights, offenses, inconveniences, persecutions, and even the death of martyrdom. Why? Because the Christian knows that God's cup though enormous and slow to fill up, will one day pour out with holy, righteous vengeance on all evil and all evildoers. At that day, every wrong will face God's wrath. The Spirit produces in us the fruit of being, as James might put it, slow to anger. This all reminds us of our need to confess our sins, so let us prepare to do so by singing the sacrifices of God, our broken spirit, on page 4. The sermon text is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. These are the words of God. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. 
and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. They said, then they said unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Our God and Father, we praise you and we thank you for Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you that he is the word made flesh and dwelt among us so that we might behold your glory. Father, we ask that you would pour out his spirit upon us now, that you would empower this word, that it would convict us of our sins, that it would give us the power and strength and courage to confess them and make them right and give us the courage and strength to hate all lies. We ask that you would do this for your glory and our good, because we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. The world is fundamentally divided between the truth and all lies. This is a fundamental divide that goes all the way to the core of everything. Jesus is the truth, and he speaks the truth of God, and those who are born of God love the truth and hear his voice, but those who are not born of God cannot hear the word because they are sons of the devil, who is a liar and the father of all lies. So when we come to considering the importance of telling the truth, repenting of our lies, and learning to hate all lies, we are talking about nothing less than fundamental loyalties, allegiances, and eternal destinies. Who are you with? Whose side are you on? Where are you going? That's what we're talking about. When we talk about telling the truth, confessing lies, coming clean, and hating all lies and loving the truth, we're talking about whose team are you on? Who are your people and where are you going? Heaven or hell? God or the devil? God's people or his enemies? So we're gonna walk through John chapter eight and use this as a springboard for talking about these things. It's striking that John begins, or at least here where we began in verse 31, John says that Jesus spoke these hard words to those Jews who believed in him. Verse 31, you might think, hey, they just believed in you, Jesus. Go easy. Uh, you know, maybe a discipleship class. And Jesus says, I am doing a discipleship class. But Jesus ends up saying, strikingly, that some of them don't believe in him. So you see this in verse 45, near the end. He says, you don't believe in me. I tell you the truth, and you do not believe me, which might seem confusing. I thought he was talking to the people who believed in him. Well, he was, he is, but I take this to mean that they were both believers and unbelievers in the crowd. As simple as that. A number of Jews had believed. They were beginning to believe. Maybe some were sitting on the fence still, and there are some in the crowd who certainly don't believe. And I take it as this 
sermon, this message that Jesus is giving is serving to push those people. It's confirming believers further in belief. Maybe some of the fence sitters were pushed and actually became believers, and others who were sitting on the fence hardened and became unbelievers, and those who were already unbelievers hardened in their unbelief. This doesn't mean that all the Jews who believed him in, in him at the beginning uh, all became offended and then by the end never mind, we don't believe after all, or that the Jews who had believed in him were actually unbelievers all along and sons of the devil all along. I don't think that does justice to either side, uh, either statement. But it does mean that Jesus was not seeker sensitive. It does mean that Jesus knew that even the believers needed to hear hard words. It means that the hard truth is good for those who believe. The hard truth is good for those who believe, especially when it's aimed directly at their pride. The hard truth is also good because it divides believers and unbelievers. So this is part of what Jesus is up to. He knows there are believers, there's brand new believers, and so he drives hard on the truth in order to confirm them in the truth, those who have truly believed, and to drive those sitting on the fence thinking, I can give it a little bit longer, I, I probably don't have to decide right now. No, drive them into the truth, and those who are hardening or not going to believe at all, it, it separates them. This is also good, and it's good for believers, it's good for the truth, it's good for the world to divide those who believe and those who will not believe. Jesus, master preacher, immediately, immediately finds their pride hideout, which is apparently and deeply ironically related to the notion of freedom. So you see this in verses 31 and 32. The Jews lie to Jesus, insisting that they have never been in bondage to anyone, which is a whopper if there ever was one, right? Let's see, anything significant happened in the history of Israel involving slavery? No, I can't think of anything. I imagine, uh, imagine some of the kids in the crown standing there getting shushed by their parents for asking about Passover. <laughs> but daddy, I thought, pa shh, quiet. Right. Right, the whole history of Israel, the, the establishment of Israel as a nation, it begins, the whole crux of it is that they were slaves in Egypt and God brought them out and they're sitting there you know, straight faced, but we have never been slaves to anyone. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? Are you kidding me? Jesus is undeterred and insists that all who sin are fundamentally enslaved. Jesus knows that this factual lie is not really the issue. I mean, he could have gotten distracted at that point. Hey, yes, yes you have. But he knows that's not the issue, and they're not going to suddenly admit it right there on the fly because the problem is that they're enslaved to sin. And so he knows the problem is even deeper than that. So he's undeterred, he's undistracted by this blatant, bald-faced lie that they've never been slaves to anyone. Not only that, I just think about all the ways in which, you know, they were carried off into exile how many times? Well, you know, the story of judges, anyone, right? Babylon, Persia, now they're not exactly free under the Romans. It's just, just full of lies. Jesus is undeterred, un, uh, undistracted, and insists that all who sin are fundamentally enslaved and only he can set men free. We see this in verses 34 through 36. Their pride is at the center of these lies, and it's pride in their Jewishness, in the fact that they have paperwork, that they can trace their lineage back to Abraham. It's all wrong, Jesus says, because they want to kill him, something that Abraham would not have done. Verses 37 through 40. Jesus says they're doing the works of their father all right, but he isn't Abraham or God because they don't understand him. So see this in verses 41 through 43. Children recognize the voice of their father in utero. Children can recognize the voice of their father in their mother's womb, beginning at that point, early on. And therefore, if the words of Jesus are nonsense to these people, 
If they're nonsense to them, the devil is their father. God is not their father, and there really are only two options. Either God is your father or the devil is your father. Those are your options. Some of the Jews are already plotting to kill Jesus, and this is hardly surprising since lies and murder go together. Lies and murder go together. Lies are verbal murder. Lies are verbal violence. Lies are verbal hatred and malice. Lies are verbal murder, and they originate from the same place as murder. They originate from the father of all lies, who was a murderer from the beginning, verse 44. So he's a father of all lies, he's a liar from the beginning, he's a murderer from the beginning. That's because lies and hatred, lies and murder go together. Jesus insists that those who do not believe him fundamentally refuse because they hate the truth. They hate the truth. It's not as if they don't have enough information. It's not as if they just, if they had just a little bit to go on, then they say, oh, I see what you mean. No, they would never see it because they hate it. They despise it. Jesus makes the same point by inviting someone to testify that he is lying in verse 46. He says, if I'm lying, show me. Come on. Point it out. Bring, it, bring a witness. Testify. If I'm lying. But since no one will, he points out that the only other option is believing in him. Again, verse 46. Jesus concludes that it's all actually very simple. Those who are of God love the truth and love his word, and those who do not love the truth do not love his word and are therefore not of God. Verse 47. You might sum up all of this, this whole section, as Jesus just saying, okay, choose this day whom you will serve. We've got a number of new believers here in the crowd. There's a number of you sitting on the fence. There's a number of you who, who are plotting to kill me and everything in between. Okay. This can't, you can't hold together like this long. Choose this day whom you will serve. Who are your people? And notice that as he presses the question of who is your father, he's necessarily pressing the question who are your brothers, right? The, the, the allegiance to the father always assumes an allegiance to a family, to a community. And so he's pressing that point, who's your God? Who's your father? And so therefore, who are your people? You're going to just stand there in this crowd of Jews like this, whistling. <laughs> You're just going to stand there in this crowd of Jews and be okay with this diversity. It can't last. It can't stand. Who are your people? Who is your God? Who are your people? Choose this day whom you will serve. Because God created the heavens and the earth by speaking, in Genesis 1, God spoke, let there be light. He created the heavens and the earth by the word of his power. Because he upholds all things by the word of his power, we see this in Hebrews 1, 3, lying is always an attempt to unmake the world as it actually is. So God spoke the world. Its existence is his truth. He says light, and what comes to be is, is the truth of his word, right? But those who then begin to speak lies are fighting against that word. They are seeking to unmake the world as it actually is, which is an act of pride and insolence and war. To tell a lie is to be at war with the world that God actually made and the world that God is he's actually upholding. What has actually happened in the world, the truth of history, the truth of the fact of the matter, lying is at war with that. War is seeking to unmake that, twist that, proudly, insolently. Proverbs 26 says, a lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. So not only does lying hate the God who created the world and the God who upholds the world, the God who upholds all the facts of the world, the truth of the world, not only is lying at war with God, but lying is at war with all those who are made in the image of God. It's at war with people. 
There's no such thing as a harmless lie. Uh, my, my lie didn't hurt anyone. No, that's not true. If it's a lie, it is crushing. If it's a lie, it is working ruin. Telling the truth is required by the ninth commandment, which specifically forbids bearing false witness against your neighbor. See this in Exodus 20, verse 16, the giving of the Ten Commandments. But this is not merely a prohibition against actively lying under oath in court. You may not sidestep this and say, well, you know, right, if I was in court and I raised my hand and put my hand in the Bible and they said, do you swear to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth? And so if I did that and then I proceeded to lie, then I would have broken the ninth commandment. I get it, pastor. I, I got it. That's not, yeah, you may not do that. You may not lie under oath in court, but the ninth commandment is not merely prohibiting that. The ninth commandment is also like all the other commandments requiring something of you. It's not merely a prohibition against something that you may not do. It's also requiring something of you. It's requiring you also to actively rejoice in the truth and hate and resist all lies. The ninth commandment is also requiring you to rejoice in the truth, love the truth, and hate and resist all lies. We see this in a number of places. In Deuteronomy 19, there's prohibitions against those who would bear false witness, bringing a false accusation. Again, you say, yeah, well, I know I'm not supposed to do that, right. But it goes on, and it says that if it's proven that a testimony has been false, then the one who uh, gave that false testimony must be punished. And what would have happened had their testimony been accepted is to be done to the false witness, but it doesn't stop there. It then says to the whole congregation, you must not pity this man. So, so in the upholding of truth, there's a number of layers to keeping the ninth commandment. There's obviously the guy sitting in the testimony box the witness box, but now there's, there's, uh, 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 there's pressure, there's uh, the requirement that those who are in the courtroom cross-examine these false witnesses, demonstrate that it's false. Now, you, then, you, then it goes out further. Those in the congregation, those in the community, you may not feel bad for them, for the consequences that come on their head. You're to take part, actually, in, in the ancient Israel, that you would literally take part. If, if, they had, if, it was, if it was a capital case and they had testified, yeah, I saw such and such person, they committed the murder and they were totally lying and they didn't commit the murder, then they were liable to capital punishment themselves for that false testimony for what they would have done to their brother. And it would require then that those people in the congregation all participate in carrying out the capital sentence. And your eye shall not pity him the law commands, which means that everybody in the community has a, a role to play. Everyone in the community is either loving the truth and upholding the truth and hating all lies or not. Proverbs 13.5 says that a righteous man hates all lies, hates all lies, is not friendly to them. Isn't, non, isn't just saying, well, that's none of my business. No, he hates all lies. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Love. What does love do? It rejoices in the truth. It loves the truth. It celebrates the truth. You can't love the truth. You can't celebrate the truth and be friends with lies at the same time. All of this also necessitates the active protection of your neighbor's good name. So if it's prohibited that you may not lie about your neighbor, you may not bring false accusations against your neighbor, you may not bring false testimony against your neighbor, and you are, but you're rather to uphold the truth in whatever way you possibly can, this necessitates the active protection of your neighbor's good name. Remember, a lying tongue does what? A lying tongue crushes those who it affects. It works ruin. And, and so the, the opposite of working ruin and crushing your neighbor is what? Protecting your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself, doing good to your neighbor, upholding your neighbor's 
good name. And of course, all of this is a simple application of the golden rule. Whatever you would have others do to you, do to them. Ephesians 4.25 says, put off all lying. Do not lie to one another, especially in the church, especially among brothers and sisters. Tell the truth to one another. Matthew 7, 12, Jesus again summarizes the Sermon on the Mount. Whatever you would have others do to you, do to them. Love your neighbor as yourself. The problem with lies, or the other problem with lies, in addition to hating God and hating your neighbor, is the problem with all inflation. It's the problem with all inflation. It devalues the currency which effectively steals from others. Right? When, when you devalue the, the currency, when a currency is inflated, when more money is printed than there's actual real value that it corresponds to, you've not just lied in that moment, there's this much value in the world printing off this much money, you've not only lied about that, but you've effectively stolen from everyone else's dollar because now their dollar can't buy as much as it used to be able to buy. So it's cheating, it's stealing, it's lying, it's all these things on a massive scale. But the same thing is happening in lying. When you lie, you are devaluing the truth. You're devaluing your words, but it's not just limited to you, because we're all speaking the same language. We're all speaking words together. Rather than letting your yes be yes and your no a no, lies and deception tend to drive language to extremes of oaths and profanities and obscenities to try to make up for all the fake news. Right? This is what I mean, you hear this sometimes, people say, well, I, I use strong language because I want people just to really know that I mean it. Why do you need to use such strong language, such obscene language, such profane language? Why do you need to be swearing oaths constantly to get people to believe you? Why is your word not worth anything? But again, notice it's not just limited to you. Now it can be centered in particular individuals who have a, a, a track record or habits of lying and not being true to their word, not keeping the word, and, and so it, it gets harder and harder to believe them, but it's not limited to them. It spreads in communities and cultures such that you, it begins to spend. Now everybody sort of feels like they've got to up the ante a little bit. I can't just say it subtly because nobody will believe me. So I've got to say it really strongly so that people will hear me, so that people will know that I mean it, that I'm telling the truth. In Hebrews it does say that an oath can establish the truth and so there is a place for swearing oaths and keeping those oaths and telling the truth, and it can settle disputes. But those are relatively rare instances. All things being equal, we ought to let our yes be a yes and our no, no. But this requires telling the truth. Lying also includes trying to hide your sin. Trying to hide your sin not confessing sins that you know have affected people, not dealing with sin that you know has, that, that happened, that you've not dealt with, that you've not faced. You may not have actively told a lie about it. No, I never, I never stole that. No, I, no, I didn't cheat. No, I, you might not have actively told the lie about cheating, but you might have cheated and you never came clean. You're lying. You're letting that lie stand. You're letting that twisting of the truth stand and you're walking around, coming to church, raising your hands before God, confessing your sins and not dealing with that one. That's lying. Hiding your sin is lying. God sees it. Cheating is, is lying. Cheating on tests, cheating at work, turning in work and claiming that it's, it's what you said it is when it's missing something. It isn't according to the rules. It isn't according to the standards that you agreed upon. And you know that. Cheating is lying. Or all excuse making. Excuse making is a form of lying. 
making excuses. Well, I was late, and you're constantly telling something, some story, and you got good stories, and you say, well, it, it's, it's part of, I mean, it really ha happened that, I mean, there's an accident, and then I got pulled over, and, and then it was, you know, the dog, and, and then it was, right. But the real truth is that you don't plan ahead. The real truth is that the fact that you're always late, you're never on time, you never get your payment in on time, you never get to work on time, you never keep your word exactly, is because you're not planning. You don't really take seriously the deadline. That's the truth. Or what about boasting, vain boasting, constantly talking yourself up, spinning yourself as the best, implicitly pushing other people down, comparing yourself constantly to others. This is not, you know, there's a, there's a godly boasting in God, there's a godly rejoicing in the gifts of God, but there's also vain boasting, talking about yourself all the time, thoughtless of others. This can be a form of lying and deception. Do you see yourself as God sees you? Do you see yourself as, as the truth sees you? Or do you have one of those mirrors that's constantly expanding you and everyone else is pushed to the corners? There's a soundtrack playing around your life as the hero of the movie, the central character. You liar. You're not the central character. The story's not about you. Or what about flattery? It's probably one of the great Christian sins, the great Christian form of lying, falsely praising what is not praiseworthy. As someone walks in with an immodest dress on, oh, you look great. You lied. They don't look great. You say, but that would be awkward to point that out. Yes, but you lied. Or flattery can just be pretending that all is well, when obvi obviously it isn't. There's an elephant in the room and you walked in and you carefully worked your way all the way around the room without touching or alluding to the elephant once and then out you go, everything's fine, everything's good, everything's smooth. It's called flattery. You're pretending everything's fine, sipping tea while the house is on fire. And just, just going up in flames, and how was your day? You know there's sin, you know there's problems, you know there's something wrong. And of course, I know, you remember, I preached a sermon not too long ago, mind your own business. There's not everything is your business to address, but many things are, and flattery refuses to. Flattery lies rather than telling the truth, rather than loving your neighbor in the truth. Like fiscal inflation, lying tends to breed more lying. Lying tends to breed more lying. Not only are your words worth less, but now it tends to encourage the breeding of more lies. Most lies come in fire sale deals of packs of 10 or 12. You had to lie to yourself the first time, right? You had to lie to yourself the first time when you didn't, when you, when you told someone else a lie. You had to lie to yourself the first time to justify the lie you told to someone else. I, I just, I just, I can't tell them the truth. I gotta just, no, this, this is the only way. I can't handle it anyway. I gotta do it like this. And then you had to lie to yourself again immediately afterwards when you didn't immediately confess the truth of the lie. No, it's, it'll be fine. It, it won't affect anything. It won't hurt anybody. This is the best thing to do. Lie to yourself a second time. Meanwhile, you're lying to God the entire lot, the entire time, right? God's there. <laughs> The whole time, God, I have to tell this lie. God, I have to do this. No, that's a lie. <laughs> You're lying to God. And then when you say after the fact, no, I can't confess it, that would be, make too much trouble and it would be so embarrassing and I, I, I don't know, who knows what would happen. You're lying to God there. When God says, no, tell the truth. Put it right, come clean. But since you've attempted to remake the whole world, basically, according to your own arrogant wisdom, Every th everything else in the world must eventually be shifted to fit your version of the world. 
You, you have one particular area that you've lied about, but you know what you're doing is you're shifting what ultimately what you think the whole world is supposed to be like. And the ripples have to go out. It may take a while. It may be subtle eventually, uh, su subtle initially. But you can't say, no, this is just isolated. I only want to remake this part of the world. I, I only want to adjust this part of the world. That's all I need to do. I promise I won't touch anything else. Ha! Maybe it started as lying about the $5 missing from the counter or what you did with your friends last night or the project at work. But now you have to explain where you got the $5. Now, that's, that's another lie. And in order to make that lie work, there's probably other pieces that you've got to connect to that one. Yeah, well, you know, it was the time I, I, I did that one thing for so-and-so. You did, when was that? Well, last Tuesday, right? There, and there it goes. Right? There's spider webs out. Or what did you do with your friends last night? Now you're involving your friends. Now that there's other people, well, we went, we did such and such with so-and-so, right? And now maybe you, now you realize, well, maybe someone's gonna check on this. I gotta call them quick and hey, uh, just don't say that and say this other thing. And now you're lying to them and now they're gonna have to lie if they're gonna cover for you and it spreads. And be sure, your sin will always find you out. And with it will come great trouble. One lie is trouble enough, but as the lie increases, as the lie goes deeper, as the deception goes deeper, as your words are inflated and they're worth less, and you find yourself telling little lies here and little lies there, and you, don't, and you realize, I don't, even, I don't even know why I told that little lie, doesn't even matter. I was just, I just did. Trouble is increasing, and God sees it all. Now, it's always a bit dicey preaching on something like this because there are certain tender consciences here in this room that are pricked at the thought of lying. And suddenly they wonder if they need to confess that one time when they said it was 315, but the second hand wasn't quite all the way to 12, so it was actually 314. And then there are the folks in the room who think everything is like rounding and approximating because they have no real regard for the truth. In fact, as I was thinking about this fact that I'm dealing with a, a big crowd, a lot of people in a lot of situations with a vast expanse here, it's sort of like John 8. There's Jesus talking to a crowd of believers and unbelievers, a, as an expanse with everything in between. It's a common challenge. So here's the rule of thumb directly from Jesus. Do unto others what you'd have them do to you. That's just the rule of thumb. Do unto others what you'd have them do to you. In most instances, people would rather you not come back to them and tell them, when I said it was 315, the second hand was about three seconds before it got there. I'm so sorry. Right? You know, most folks, you know, like, you got better things to do. Right? Please, no. Don't bother me. I, I have better things to do. Okay? So love your neighbor as yourself and recognize that in most instances, that's not a lie. That's just rounding and that's normal. Cool it. Relax. Can I imagine any situations where that would matter? Sure, you're doing a one minute time test for your math facts. And you, you've fudged on 10 seconds. That's, is that a lie? Yeah, that would be a lie. That matters. You're running the clock at the Olympics. Okay, yeah, that probably matters. Unless the difference between 314 and 315 was an intentional attempt to make yourself look better or give yourself some kind of advantage or in some way to, to, to put your, your neighbor down or leave your neighbor behind, you probably need to stop agonizing over that kind of thing. Do not be cheated of the reward of a clean conscience by a false humility, Colossians 2.18. Paul says in Colossians 2 to be aware of people who make up rules in order to make you feel bad 
in order to cheat you out of your clean conscience. If Jesus died for you and bled for your sins and you're clean, then do not allow false rules, false standards about lying and deception to creep in such that you're sitting there falsely accusing yourself of lies you didn't tell. Bearing false witness against yourself is still bearing false witness. Are you lying about yourself to yourself? Stop it. Some of you need to stop telling those lies. The lie is not what you think it is. The lie is you're obsessing over yourself in a way that's deceptive, untrue, deceitful. Generally speaking, I tell people, you have a 30 second rule. Okay, maybe a minute. I'll give some people a minute, but that's it. Okay, you say, is this a sin? Was this a lie? Okay, explain why it's a lie in 30 seconds. Well, I, you know, the teacher said to not look at anybody else's papers and I looked at someone else's paper. Okay, it's a lie. It was cheating. Go confess it, <laughs> right? You can, you can des describe it. But if you're sitting there agonizing, well, it was, you know, it was, ah, I, didn't, I don't know, and it was, you know, the second hand and it was going and I just wasn't sure. Stop it. You're not that important, <laughs> right? You're not that important. <laughs> God loves you and you have better things to do. Do not be a false witness against yourself. Stop telling those lies. But if you have a habit of rounding and spinning everything to your advantage and to others' disadvantage, you're a liar. And those lies are murderous acts of hatred against God and your neighbor. If you are constantly spinning, constantly shifting, constantly twisting so that you are better, so that others can't quite keep up with you, so that you get the golden star, so that you get the raise or you think you're going to get the raise, making excuses, cheating, maybe very, very slightly, trying to hide your sin, pretending it's not there, then you are a liar. And those lies are murderous acts of hatred against God and your neighbor. And liars will be cast into hell with the rest of the wicked. Revelation 21, 8. Some people will go to heaven. Some people will go to heaven because, well, everyone's going to go to heaven because their sins were washed away by the blood of the lamb. But some people will go to hell. Some people will go to hell simply because they were liars. They looked pretty, they looked clean, they looked like they had things together, and they were liars. They spun and they twisted the truth, and God will say to them on the last day, depart from me, I never knew you. Since lies are fundamentally at war with God and his reality, it's a terrible existence to live with unconfessed lies. It's a terrible existence to live with unconfessed lies. Psalm 32 is perhaps one of the best places in Scripture to des that describes what this is like. Psalm 32 starts, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. The word guile means deceit, lies. He says, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Unconfessed lies is like a sickness that will not go away, like a weight around your neck constantly pull pulling you down, like a thirst you cannot quench, like a deep pit in your stomach that constantly aches. And the psalmist says, this is God's hand heavy upon you. This is God's hand heavy upon you, pushing you down. You're fighting God. The good news of the gospel is that God laid his hand heavy upon Jesus on the cross in order that you might confess your sins and be rid of them forever. 
Jesus had God's hand heavy upon him on the cross in your place so that you could be rid of your sins, so that you could come clean, so that you could confess it all honestly before him and be cleansed forever. God laid his hand heavy upon his son on the cross so that you might be free. This is the truth that sets all men free. But in order to be set free, you must admit that you have been enslaved to your sins. You must admit that you have been enslaved to your sins. You have been enslaved to your sins and you've lied. Do you want God's hand heavy upon you or upon Christ? Do you want God's hand heavy upon you or upon Christ? What will it be? What will you have? God's hand heavy upon you. That aching pit in your stomach, that weight that won't go away, that nagging feeling that won't stop. Or would you be free? Would you be free? You cannot get this freedom piecemeal or by partial confession. The devil would come alongside you and say, well, just confess a little bit of it. Just, you know, a little bit. Well, it'll just take the edge off. You'll feel better. And sometimes you can do that. You can confess one of 15 lies and sort of have a little bit of a cathartic effect, a little relief for a moment. It won't go away. You won't really be clean. You won't really be set free. It's all or nothing. Christ or nothing. What do you want? What do you want? Do you want to be free or do you want to be a slave? Do you want to be clean or do you want to keep walking around in that filth? Where do you want his heavy hand? Do you want it upon you or do you want it upon his son in your place? When you come clean, when you confess your sins, when you confess your lies and your deceptions, when you come to Christ in all honesty, there is complete forgiveness and freedom. When you stop lying, when you tell the truth, about your sin and what has happened, and you come before Christ, there's nothing but freedom. It's all freedom. It's wonderful freedom. It's joyful freedom. It's clean freedom. That's the good news. God becomes your hiding place, the psalmist says. He says, when I confessed my sins, you heard my prayer and you forgave my iniquity. The psalmist says, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Who who is compassing the sinner about with songs of deliverance? God is. You hear that? When you come to God, he sings the song of deliverance around you. That's why you're free. You're set free because it's your father singing over you, rejoicing over you because you've come clean, because now you're free. Now you're a son and now you've come home. That's how he receives you. You say, but I've lied. It's bad. It was a long time ago. There's a lot of repercussions. Yeah, but slavery stinks. Do you want to be free? Or they were slaves in Egypt 400 years, and God set them free. Do you want to be free? How long has it been? Do you want to be clean? Do you want to be free? Then come home. Come clean. Confess your sins. And let God rejoice over you. He is welcoming you here. He's ready for you here. He says, come. He has a song of deliverance to sing all around you. Because Jesus, his son, died in your place, died for that sin. So tell the truth. Agree with God. He died for it. He bled for it so that I could be free. Our God and Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus, your own son, so that we could be free of all our lies. Father, we know we live in a culture and a world that's so trapped and enslaved by lies. And we know that because of our complicity in this sin, we have not helped at all. So Father, we cry out to you and we ask you to set us free. And we know that by asking you to set us free, we're asking you to give us the courage and the strength to come clean. Father, I pray that we would confess all our lives, 
that everyone in this room would be clean and would be truly free. Father, help us to do this. Help us to do this. Because we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. If you've ever learned an instrument or played some sport or did artwork of some type, the experience of going back and watching the home videos of those performances, those recitals, those games or art shows can be painfully embarrassing. But we should never look at the gangly preteen to gauge what the full-grown man will be. Don't listen to the screechy scratching of a five-year-old fiddle player to determine what the concert violinist will sound like. In a similar way, don't look to your spiritual immaturity as the gauge for what God is turning you into. You and I will one day judge angels. If we were to behold the glorified saints, we'd be tempted to worship them. You may be discouraged at, with how immature your faith is, how prone to wander you are, yet here before us is a reminder that God feeds his children. But it isn't junk food that he feeds them. He nourishes them with that which will bring about their growth in godliness. The nourishment found here on this table of the Lord's Supper is the Lord of this supper himself. He is here in these elements to nourish your faith and transform you from one degree of glory to the next. One day we shall look back on, on our immaturity and rather than wincing, we will see how faithfully our Lord cared for us, grew us up, chastised our follies, and trained us into spiritual manhood. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus. Father, we thank you for growing us up, for nourishing us. Uh, by your Son, our Lord Jesus, we thank you for feeding us with him. We pray that you would bless this meal as we partake of it for the glory of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, when he had given thanks, he took bread and he broke it. Thomas Watson, the, the great Puritan writer, uh, once addressing the sin of lying, uh, gave some very practical Puritan wisdom. And he notes that um, while God has given us a command to not lie, God has also set two natural fences to keep in the tongue, the teeth and the lips. So if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. If you can't speak the truth, the teeth and the lips are your friends. Now hear the benediction of the Lord. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.